Thank you very much uh, for the, the very kind, uh, flattering introduction, Renee. Uh, I'd like to get started by um, paying homage and, and thank the people that uh, allow me to do this kind of work. Um, uh, those of you who don't know, um, there's basically uh, dozens of people involved uh, downstairs in the facility that uh, uh, take care of our ferry colleagues and um, and keep the operation running. Uh, and I'm, I'm deeply indebted to, the, uh, to these people. I want to thank the various uh, funding sources, of course, the people in my lab, and then also uh, this particular group of people, two of which uh, have moved on and are doing postdoc already, um, that collected the data, some of which that I will show to you guys today. And last but not least, uh, now to Kia. And uh, so uh, each time I get to talk about this uh, in front of a group of, of young aspiring scientists, I want to point this out. Um, you should not just try to connect uh, vertically and build networks vertically with people that are more senior to you. You should really strive to branch out horizontally and make friends with people that are in your cohort because they will become more important to you as your career goes along. Now is such a case. I met now as a graduate student, uh, we had very strong fellow interests and we've been collaborating basically ever since. And uh, this has really uh, borne fruit as you will see uh, hopefully today. So actually, I want to give all the credit to now because the ideas that I'm going to show you largely stem from now. And uh, so I'm just uh, basically a humble messenger to uh, introduce you some uh, to his theories. So what allows me to do that? Well, there's a variety of factors that allows me to do that. One of them is the situation that we're all in, which is that uh, many of us were forced to spend more time at home and with family and uh, so very quickly, uh, you might have uh, also found that uh, you have more time on your hand and what uh, should be done with it. Uh, well, for me, that meant trying to keep connected with other scientists. And I felt I wasn't the only one. So uh, what happened was that more and more on YouTube, channels popped up where scientists were um, inviting each other to Zoom talks. And rather than just doing that over a closed Zoom setting where you needed to have a password, they would stream that live on YouTube and other scientists could come in. And uh, so they, these are three YouTube channels that I just want to point out that I basically became addicted to. And they launched me into what I'm talking to you guys today. So I'm advertising for you guys to use your spare time, use the time before you fall asleep, go on YouTube, find these channels. They're, they're rapidly growing and I think they're revolutionizing science because that allows you to find topics that you are really interested in, find the other four people on the planet that are equally interested in that, and have a rapidly evolving field. Um, so huge advantages to, uh, to this kind of approach. And so I'm not just talking theory here. Uh, what these three channels have in common is largely what I will talk about today has already spurred a lot of things into action. So uh, this society, the Association for the Mathematical uh, Consciousness Science, just got founded about a week, uh, a month or two ago because of these YouTube channels, out of these YouTube channels. And uh, that society immediately sprung into action, uh, launched special issues at Frontiers and a journal called Entropy. It got funding from various sources and there will be a conference uh, two weeks from now where uh, many of us are coming together virtually and will speak and next year it's expected to be in person. So uh, it really is, I think, a shift here that might have happened throughout the pandemic for science to become more international, to become more collaborative, and for communities to grow within science uh, uh, around the globe. So what is this particular community interested in? Well, some of us uh, might be interested in that as well, which is the basic problem that uh, uh, faces neuroscience, maybe one of the biggest problems of neuroscience, maybe one of the biggest problems in science at all which is that we all believe as neuroscientists that there's a causal connection between neuronal activity in our brain and our conscious experience, our perception of the world, the, the fact that we feel love, that we see colors, the fact that as you fall into deep sleep, the world goes away for you. It's as if you wouldn't exist, but as you come out into dream sleep or back um, as you wake up, the world com comes back for you. So I will call this phenomenology, the fact that, there, that you subjectively experience but the embarrassing fact for neuroscience is that this hasn't worked yet. So usually what we do as scientists is that we find uh, the causal connection and then mathematically reduce one onto the other. And that's when we say we understood it. That's what we do in physics, that's what we do in chemistry, biology, and a lot of neuroscience. But for this part of our, uh, of our being, the phenomenology, the fact that we have subjective experience, this step seems to be uh, hard to reach. In fact, there are many people that would argue that this is fundamentally impossible. That uh, we will never be able to do that as scientists. You shouldn't even try. 
Well, I'm going to argue to the contrary. And, and that is what a lot of these YouTube channels uh, inspired me to do. So this is a slide from one of the labs that's involved. And so what they're uh, suggesting is that we have to move away from this conventional approach of neuroscience of correlating inputs to the brain with activity in the brain or uh, behavior uh, uh, perception comes out of it, and have to take another step that links, in this case, phenomenology, our subjective experience of consciousness, conscious perception, with brain activity via math. What do, what do I mean by via math? Well, if we believe that consciousness can be explained in terms of science, what we have accomplished as scientists, what all of scientists rests on, is that we find laws of nature, that we're able to express these laws of nature with mathematical formalism, gravity, uh, Maxwellian equations, you name it, that's when we feel as scientists we've actually had an accomplishment, we've actually done it. So can we do that for consciousness? And so there's a pathway mapped out, and that's what I want to share with you guys today. Well, so what's the traditional approach? So the traditional approach, as a lot of you are familiar with, started um, obviously with experimental psychology, but um, I would argue that experimental psychology, people like Wundt um, and, and, uh, and others, they were still careful to touch on this subjective consciousness experience side. And the first people who made a bold inroad into that uh, was uh, Fechner, um, together with his mentor Weber. And so they found a technique, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to elaborate too much about it, to quantify subjective experience. So to go away from saying you can't measure love to say, uh, I know exactly four love is, is twice as much as two love. And we can measure that. A lot of you are doing that all the time in the laboratories objectively, and we can come up with mathematical equations. Um, to express these laws. Um, uh, a little bit later, in the 1960s, this was generalized by Stevens by uh, basically uh, introducing two more techniques that weren't done uh, by the original inventors of psychophysics, and then uh, finding a generalization of the mathematical laws that we have. And then it seemed like we're getting stuck. And so what might be that next step? Well, what I'm going to argue about today has many names because it's a new mushrooming field, but one of them I will use a lot is qualia structuralism. And the idea is that we can mathematically express our conscious experience, our phenomenology, and then find mathematical laws, how that maps onto similar abstract geometrical mathematical spaces derived from neural data. That's the basic idea. Now, uh, the first thing that we'll have to do there is we'll have to find the structure of qualia. And qualia is a philosophical fancy term for your uh, experience. And so I took this here from a paper by Jennifer Trueblood, who has done pioneering research into that. And I put it on here because this paper shows that when it comes to these spaces that might describe our perceptual phenomenolog phenomenological subjective experience, they are non-trivial. So what Jennifer showed uh, and reviewed in this paper is that these spaces might be non-Euclidean, that certain things that you think are more similar and they move closer to space, uh, if you look at them from a different angle, all of a sudden they seem to be wider apart. And so uh, it might take more uh, uh, unconventional math, such as quantum uh, math, then from quantum theory, and some of the math I talk about today to bridge this gap and to describe these things. But it is, of course, for many of us that study perception, not news that we can express phenomenological experience in terms of geometrical spaces. So this right here is the color space that most of us are familiar with, that all of the colors that we can see, we can put in a three-dimensional space and, and map onto what might be largely looking as a sphere. If you're interested in music, there's a similar geometrical description of the, the phenomenological space that you hear in music, which is that if you have uh, a note and you go up an octave, the note clearly is a higher note, but at the same time, there's similarity with the original note. And if you do this with all of these notes, you end up with a helical uh, three-dimensional structure. And uh, more recently, um, phase space uh, is an example of multi-dimensional spaces that people have come up with for objects, for faces, for uh, other um, structures of our experience and mapping them into these geometrical mathematical spaces. So if we accept this, that we can come up with mathematical descriptions of a phenomenological space, then what's the next step to go to the brain? So this is the suggestion of qualia structuralism, that let's say you have a chord, and you have another chord where you, where you move one of the notes. It sounds similar. It also sounds different. And that's because it would basically be a transform within that helical musical space from one of these uh, loops to another. So if I uh, play an example for that, let's see if this works. <laughs> Pretty much the same song, but all I did here is transpose by an octave. So you were listening to the same structure, I just moved it 
down in this three-dimensional helical space. So the proposal is that if we derive neural activity from the brain and we come up with a similar uh, mathematically formalized abstract structure of neural activity, we should see some kind of relationship as we are experiencing one of these songs and the other song that might resemble in some way what the phenomenological space does. So I'm um, uh, now, in fact, <laughs> and, and me in this case as a co-author, we were suggesting that there may be an isomorphism, that you would find a similar kind of transformation uh, in these space, in these uh, abstract spaces, but uh, there's many ways, I'm sorry about playing this song again, uh, there's many different ways that these spaces could relate, and I'm just, uh, I'm not going uh, too much into depth here, but category theory is a new, a relatively new branch of mathematics, so there's a lot of buzz around it, and that is exactly what category theory is trying to do. It's taking different uh, mathematical structures, in this case here you can see geometry and algebra, and trying to find the relations between them. And these uh, relations that can be mathematically expressed we call functors. So in the end what we're trying to do is we try to find a functor between the uh, abstracted brain activity and uh, the uh, mathematically formalized uh, uh, phenomenological structure to translate between them. This could be isomorphism, this could be something else. Well, I hope I convinced you that this part here um, is, is a fruitful research program and already underway, and you might agree with me with this, but you, you might um, have doubts about this one. So how do we get to these uh, structures from brain activity that would allow us to find some kind of mapping between the, the uh, structuralized qualia space and neuronal space? Yes? Yes. Yes. So, um, so what I'm saying, is, so most of them are correlative. And so what, what I will go to now is that I'm, I'm trying to find, rather than a, a Pearson correlation, I'm, what I'm trying to go at is, is something that, that's actually uh, more like a mathematical law of nature. So rather, because, and I don't want to go too much into, into the problems that, that, that correlational approaches have, but what, what, I'm, what I'm going to make it, uh, to in the next couple of slides is that we're trying to get something that's deeper in terms of uh, breaking correlation into causal structures, and that might allow us to make that, loop, uh, that link more directly. So uh, I might not convince you yet, but maybe uh, uh, at the end of the talk we can, we can talk about it. Well, okay, some of the ones that I'm thinking about are, but maybe we should talk more about the talk. So the theory that, that, um, that again, I'm, I'm just using here to, to make that leap is integrated information theory by Giulio Tononi. And there's a lot to say about integrated information theory. It's a very complex theory that's, that's truly interdisciplinary. It spends uh, a lot of different branches of how we usually uh, divvy up um, our thinking in academia. So I'm not gonna uh, talk too much about it. Um, uh, in terms of what the background is and explaining it, I think that would be at least another lecture, if not a whole graduate seminar um, of a whole semester. But um, I will give you some um, of the ideas of integrated information theory. The first one is that if we think about consciousness, uh, typically uh, uh, this is a, a consensus diagram that has uh, made the rounds in the last couple of years, which is that consciousness seems to be at least two-dimensional, and that uh, there's one axis, which we would call um, the level of consciousness, how much you're conscious, uh, you might want to call it arousal or something related, and then the other one is the content of consciousness, which is how much you experience, what you experience, the qualia. And the reason that we think it's at least a two-dimensional state is that we can take various states of consciousness and put them within this two-dimensional plane. And then you find, for example, that vegetative state is a state of coma where people clearly have a different level of consciousness, a different arousal. So they wake up in the morning, they open their eyes, they go to sleep at night, but there's no sign of actual conscious experience in a lot of these patients. So there's almost no content, but there's a lot of changes in arousal. That means we can dissociate these two parts of consciousness and they're probably orthogonal as I put them right here. Now, for, uh, for understanding consciousness, I think the really interesting case is up here, where you are highly uh, aroused and you have a lot of content, as I hope you're in a state that you're still in right now. Uh, I'd probably get you more to this state as I keep uh, talking on. But in this state, what I'm arguing is that you still don't uh, fully have all the access to what consciousness is doing. So uh, the example for that would be over here, if you read this really fast, you would say, oh, I read a bird in the bush. And if I say, well, try again, you would say, oh, wait a minute, it says a bird in the, the bush. But the first time you see that, you probably didn't see the second the. So that's a famous example of repetition blindness. So that means that even if you're up here and you have the highest level of consciousness, um, there are still parts um, of the world that are closed up to you, that um, you, you uh, fail to experience. Um, and now when I put it out, you can actually experience. Yes, question. So what would a content-free consciousness be? Because often, as a counterexample to consciousness, you get things like insomnia, which are uh, a prototypical example of a content-free consciousness. Like they have full arousal, 
Yeah, so I would argue it would be more to this. It doesn't go with our traditional notion of subjective experience, right? So you have, an, uh, you have a, uh, a living being that's undergoing all the signs of arousal, um, but it doesn't have any, the lights are off. There's no subjective experience. That person would be conscious in this definition, but not in this definition. And that has led to a lot of, uh, to a lot of um, well, debate in the field because there's been a lot of confusion, misunderstanding about it. So you can have, you can, if you do uh, anesthesia, for example, for more than 24 hours, as some of us do, they know that the animal gets more aroused uh, in the morning and you have to increase the anesthesia. But we don't think that the animal is having any subjective experience. But it's a sign of arousal. So other people that would say, well, uh, if you're a Buddhist Zen monk, and you can reach a state of consciousness without content, uh, if you really look into the phenomenology of that, there would still be some content because there is subjective experience, right? So I'm not talking about that. So I'm, I'm really dissociating basically the almost behavioral signs of arousal from actual subjective experience. That's my definition, though. Others might see it differently. Does it make sense? It, it makes sense, but I don't agree with this. You don't agree? Yeah, okay, we can talk about that after the talk. So uh, luckily, this is the part that, that we're probably in agreement in that I'm, I'm most interested in. So. Uh, what integrated information theory does, uh, and that is what it's mostly known for, is to quantify this axis of consciousness space. So uh, what integrated information theory does, it gives you a scalar, a single value, and it uh, tells you how much uh, the system has uh, in terms of level of consciousness. But uh, less well known is that um, this orthogonal dimension is also explained by integrated information theory, and I put this down here. So when you had this first experience of a bird in the bush, and you missed the second the, versus you had this experience of a bird in the, the bush, um, there was no change in the world, there was just a, a change in your mental state. So that means you had two phenomenological states, and that difference is also quantified by integrated information theory as a difference in the causal effect structure, or short, I will call this the, the CES. So there's a delta phi, which is what IET is known for, that shows you the, the levels of consciousness, and then the delta CES, which shows you the difference in the contents of consciousness. Yes. So are you saying one of those is more content than the other? It's different. Well, I see that, but it's like I'm trying to figure out your axis of content here because. Yeah, so in this particular example, I would say that you have more content when you're aware of the second the because you see an extra the. But well, that seems questionable, right? Because in one case, you're paying attention to the meaning, and there's a whole lot of like certain kind of processing, whereas in the other case, you're paying attention to something very superficial. That may not be important. So in that I might pay attention to the fact that you know some letters touch the triangle there and then I'm aware of that and I, is that important? But that's more. So I that's a fair point. I mean, for me as a vision scientist, uh, just from the vision perspective, I would say you have more content here than you have here. But in, in fact, um, I, I'm not. I'm not make. I don't want to make too much of a point of quantification here when it comes to the difference in phenomenology. More that we can uh, we can look at the difference between two phenomenological states. It might be equally content rich, but the fact that there is a difference, we can quantify the difference. So that doesn't mean that one that there has to be an unequal sign between those. Does that make sense? Okay. I have a bigger question. Yeah. So this idea that content can be a real number may be questionable because content itself can be more or less only the same way. So this idea that you just have one real number that represents the amount of content that you just want to send. That, that okay? So that, again, let, let's try to maybe move away from the concept of amount of content, okay? Just the fact that there's different contents, that, you dif that there's different states of consciousness that you're in. Um, they can be, they can be met formalized in IIT, okay? And so that's all I'm getting at, that there's, there's two formally different states, mathematically different states. So let's make it less about the amount, but just the fact that there's a difference and we can mathematically get at it. And so just to give you an idea, so um, uh, these are not just abstract ideas. There's uh, actual mathematical formalism associated with that. And so this is from a paper that I will talk about a little bit more about today, where uh, now and his colleagues, they uh, took neural data, in this case from a fruit fly. The fruit fly um, uh, had multiple neurons in its mushroom body, which would be equivalent to what we call a brain. And then they measured phi, which is the level of consciousness, between awake and anesthetized fruit flies, and you can see that the theory um, made the correct prediction, which is that phi should be smaller in an anesthetized animal than in, in, in an uh, alert animal. This right here corresponds to that uh, in that they try to get at this causal uh, effect structure. Now, 
back when they did that study, the mathematical formalism for the causal effect structure wasn't fully developed yet. So that's one of the things where I'm saying this is really cutting edge what I'm telling you today. But they were trying to get at that by coming up with a geometric space that uh, puts the neural data uh, of the various causes and effects that you find across the neural data into uh, uh, a multi-dimensional space, in this case broken down to a three-dimensional space, and you can see that there's a difference in the cause and effect structure as well. So note the date. This is really a uh, public edge, uh, 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 cutting edge publication. So what I will show you today is that I think we can go a step further. So how does this come about? Well, at the very heart of integrated information theory is this idea that if you have an interconnected system uh, in which information flows with causal um, effectivity, let's say that you have four neurons and they're interconnected in this way, and you see the causal flow between these neurons, that if uh, you can find out about uh, these causal effects by severing some of these connections. And you can do that either experimentally or you can do that, and this is the interesting part that I hopefully can show you guys today, you can do that computationally, analytically, with your own data. And once you do that, you compare the mutilated system where you severed some of these connections with the original system. And if there's any difference in the statistical description, then you know what you just mutilated had a causal effect. It actually was important for the system. So you change the system by mutilating some of these connections. But if you mutilate some of these connections and there's no difference uh, for the system as a whole, then you know that these were reducible connections. They were actually not important for the, uh, for the function of the system. And um, this can be done mathematically. So this right here is um, some of the simplified uh, formalism that goes with integrated information theory. This is when you put it into practice uh, with Python computer code that has been available. Again, this is the paper that I just referenced from the fruit fly. And all I will do today is give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on here and then give you resources that if you are interested and you want to try it with your data, how you can do that for yourself. Okay, so why, why might this be interesting? Well, more and more, what we are doing is, when we're talking as neuroscientists, especially as cognitive neuroscientists, uh, when we're thinking about the brain, we're thinking about it more and more as a causally connected network circuitry system. And we are, because of that, measuring more and more data simultaneously across the brain. Because the idea is that we just need to know more about what each of these individual parts is doing and how they interact. And there's two steps involved in that um, that I think are crucial. The first one is that rather than just looking at activation, what integrated information theory does is it abstracts it to information. And so why is that interesting? Um, well, activation is actually more confined than the flow of information. So if we have, let's say, three neurons here and three neurons here, and they're connected with these three axons, what activation can't do is cross over between these neurons, cross its path, because activation has to flow along the physically hardwired lines of an axon. But neurons, of course, are not as simple as uh, uh, these systems right here that just receive uh, activation and pass it on. Neurons can act as logic gates. They can, make compu they can compute. So in this case, if I replace these neurons with XOR gates that are only active when, uh, depending on, on what the, the input state is, then you can see that uh, information now can cross the system. So as the activation is confined uh, with the physical connections, information flow is more fluid and, and actually can, uh, can cross the system in various ways that the activation per se can. So that's why abstracting from activation to information might be interesting for many of us in trying to understand what the brain is doing. The second issue with collecting all of these data simultaneously is that um, most of the techniques that we then use analytically to analyze these multidimensional data, so this would be in uh, this example fMRI, but the same gets done in EEG or in the single neurophysiology field, is that we're, we're trying to uh, get at the multidimensional of the data, but there's always a step in there that basically boils down to pairwise com comparisons, very often Pearson's correlations. It's just a very powerful technique. So if we do ICA, if we do graph theory, if you look at um, the, the various steps involved, typically somewhere you find that there's pairwise comparisons. And I, I would argue that that's a limitation, and I would argue that integrated information theory gets past that. So what do I mean? So let's take this very simple example of heavy and learning that I took from one of the textbooks. So if you are taking a system of three neurons interconnected, so these neurons connect onto these neurons, and then you have weights, synaptic weights that you can scale up or down to come up with a learning rule. Well, in the conventional approach, you would look at this correlation and that correlation. You look at these pairwise correlations, so you can make up a matrix and then make this examination. But what you're missing out on is the synergistic effect of these two neurons onto that neuron. So there could be a combined causal effect that you're missing by breaking up the system and just looking at the pairwise correlations. And so IIT doesn't do it. 
why doesn't it do it? So here's an example of how uh, the formalism of IIT works in practice. And the example is that you have a system with two buttons, A and B, and they basically uh, have causal effects on, in this case, uh, let's say a light or another button, C. So uh, the idea is that we're looking at um, if button A and B are uh, inactive. So in this case, shown here in white, so they're not being pushed. Uh, uh, what does that mean for the state uh, of, of this uh, causally affected system C? And so um, you can empirically do that by just taking the system and looking at what's happening. So let's say you're taking many, many trials, as we often do, 100 trials, and you see what happens if A and B are unpushed and what happens to C. And so you see that in this case, uh, in 90% of the cases, C would also be off. And then 10% of the cases, C would be on. So this could be because of noise. This could be because of a, of a, um, of a whole lot of different um, mechanisms. And then uh, the logic is to just step through all of the possible states. So you ask what happens if A is pushed. And you can see in this 90% again, uh, C is off. What happens if B is pushed? And here the interesting case, what if both of them are pushed at the same time? And so um, this, of course, uh, some of you have might know this already, leads to a table that uh, is, uh, has been used in statistics for a long time. That's what we call a transition probability matrix, or uh, it's at the very heart of Markov chains. Yes? <clears throat> so there's a few things to say about that. So first of all, this technique works best if you do know the causal structure. So if you know that these have uh, a, a, a combined, uh, th that these have this kind of caus causal effect on C, but you don't need to know that. You can infer the causal structure just by looking at the statistics of the system. So you don't need to know that. And so if one of them would have, let's say, as you said, a positive effect or negative effect, it also, again, would show up in the statistics that you're measuring that comes out. So the real, the real big step that I'm doing right here that's questionable is that I'm moving from a frequentist observation to a statistical description of the system. But of course, that's something that, that uh, a lot of statistics does all the time. But I'm arguing that you could uh, observe a system, come up with that table, and then go on um, uh, to describe the system. Other questions? OK, so if you're with me on this, then you would agree that you can, of course, do this for much more complex systems. So right here. This would be four uh, uh, logic elements that are interconnected. These could be neurons. These could be voxels. These could be areas. This could be whatever you're interested in. And one more uh, trick that I'm doing here is that rather than looking at uh, how three of these elements interact with the fourth element, I'm taking the whole system. So I'm taking all of the possible states that this system could be in. All of these are on. Three of these are on. None of these are on. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking a step forward in time. So I will call this the present. And then I'm taking a step forward in time, and I say, if this is the present state, what is the, what is the probability that I end up in any of these other possible states? So this is how I get a true transition probability matrix. In this case, the numbers are 0 and 1. So don't let that confuse you. This would be a deterministic system. But what we would be measuring most of the time would be uh, fractions in here. So it would be fractional probabilities with which the system transitions from one state into the other state. And so one simple notion would be that this right here is the cause and then this right here is the effect, because we're looking at what is causing what effect by making the jump into the future. How, how far you move from the present into the future, that's again up to you. So you could take it a millisecond, eight millisecond, one TR, uh, whatever you want. But you can look at uh, how the system, depending on which state it is in, transitions into any of these other states. Yes? Using um Neurons are yes. Like, like, right? yeah. Yes. Uh, great. So that's one. Of, and I don't know if I if I have time to talk about that. But yes. So this is one of the first things I ran into, um, looking at actual data. Uh, but uh, so my as you will see maybe as I get to that, my argument is that you, there's a certain if there's a memory in the system, then there's a certain uh, expectation to what the uh, the the uh, transition probability matrix should look like, and uh, we can actually use that to our advantage. Because then we, we can actually, uh, for example, uh, we, can, we can see if there's anything that deviates just from a system that has a simple form of memory, or it doesn't. Other question? So um, this right here is not the end of it. So this right here is not what I really mean by cause-effect structures. There's a second uh, mathematical trick that's involved where you can break down 
each of these supposed cause effect uh, uh, interactions in your data to look at which ones are actually causal. And that's maybe the part that I'm most excited about. So if I do this for my data, it turns out that most of these do not actually really have causal power. That's what I find the most interesting. But you might already have noticed that by doing this kind of trick with your data, that you're already coming up with something that is really interesting to deal with. So by just taking your data and putting it in this kind of space, uh, you come up with these very nice mathematical properties already. Um, and so in fact, if you think about almost anything that we do in machine learning or big data, starts out with, with uh, NP arrays like that, the two-dimensional two matrices. So I would argue that even if you're not interested in consciousness, there's lots of room to explore here for your data by using this approach. Yes? Yes, so it's another shortcoming, I, I totally agree. So ideally, you would have to do this for all the neurons in the brain at the same time, right? And so that's, that's a pipe dream. And in fact, as I will show in a moment, it already gets problematic with the data that we have. But I would argue that um, when, we, when we do a Fourier transform, in fact, even when we do a simple average, we are violating some of the rules that, that apply to these algorithms. So if you do a Fourier transform, you should never do that on one over F data, where the, the variant and the mean are changing over time. It should be stationary. And uh, people that do it, they would say, well, it still works. And so um, I would say that even if you have a system where you have p confounders that might be interacting with the system, or hidden Markov chains, whatever you want to call it, you don't have the entire Markov blanket, um, it's still interesting to look at that system by making these assumptions. So Yeah, no, no question's interesting. The yeah. question is, when can you jump to the causal inference? Yes, and so um, basically my, my appeal would be that you can do them, but you have to be—you uh, have to take them with a grain of salt, <laughs> kind of like we do already with greater causality and other things. But yeah, so um, there's there's an Im there's an imperfect match between what the theory in theory provides you and then what we as experimentalists can do with it in practice. But um, as I just said, I think there's other techniques. Granger causality, I think, is a good one uh, th that we violate stationarity, which is one of its, its main assumptions all the time. And yet we found interesting uh, things with Granger causality. And I'm just arguing there's a different way of doing that that goes away from pairwise uh, considerations of causality to multidimensional ones. Great questions. OK, so let's talk about actual data. So what, what my lab is mostly interested in are neural circuits. Um, and the system that we've been uh, choosing for that are the, the neural circuits that they of course have the property that, that Isabel just mentioned that they do get inputs and uh, from from outside the system but they're well structured circuits and they exist across the layers of cortex and so one reason that they're interesting is that technology has made huge jumps in the last couple of years in, in order to allow us to measure neuronal activity across the layers of cortex so this of course is a co com commercial approach to that but um, uh, some people uh, don't know yet that these kinds of electrodes that Elon Musk is using for his company, they're actually readily available um, they're down in my office if you want to see them uh, to research scientists. So uh, Elon, of course, is trying to do this in humans. Uh, what does Elon have to say? Electrodes in human brains are the future. You might get one some time as well. So that, thanks, thanks to the fact of machine learning, we can do these things. But um, we use these kinds of electrodes. Electrodes. Oh, silence, Elon. We use these kinds of electrodes to measure along the layers of cortex to get at what we think is a, a, a cortical column in the system. And then uh, we have these simultaneous measurements of neurons or population activity. And so I'm trying to get to the causal effect structure of these. So here's, here's the, the first bad news. So if you take, this again could be voxels or areas. In this case, it's electro channels of these arrays where we can make these measurements. And you look at the size of the transition probability matrix, of course, you run into a combinatorial explosion. So for most of what I will show today, I will be stuck at six channels because my laptop got stuck at six channels. So if we go up to uh, electrodes that, that my lab has been using 10 years ago, you already get uh, to uh, numbers that are twice as large as the number of atoms in a cell. And then uh, this right here is uh, what my lab will be using hopefully in a week from now. And you can see that we're, we're, reaching, we're reaching numbers that are absolutely um, beyond astronomical. Again, I feel, I don't, at first, when I hear these uh, limitations of the theory, I feel at first uh, maybe a little bit depressed or discouraged. But then you go and you watch some YouTube talks again about quantum computing and the leaps that are being done there. And I think that these kinds of problems are technical problems. I, I think that they're solvable in the long run. Yes? I, I, there is Yeah, yeah, I know. There's a m way more than the atoms in the universe. Uh, yeah. So and so, it's, and this is this is just one electrode with 300 channels. So when we're talking about measuring all the neurons in the brain, you see where the theory runs into serious problems, right? 
But as I said, I think these are technical limitations. Uh, and, and also, there's other ways to, uh, to dimensionality reduce before you maybe apply the theory. So let's use six measurements of the brain simultaneously. And I will use this graphic to show you all the 64 states that are possible for these six measurements. So all of them on, all of them off. So um, if these are neurons, uh, on or off is easy to understand. This might be a neuron firing an action potential or not an action potential. But most of us, we're not using neurons. I'm not using neurons here. So what I'm doing is I'm basically binarizing the data. So you can just take your data, take a trial. You take the average activity of your trial. This might be just your fMRI signal, your EG signal, whatever you have. And then you, you just say, what's above and below? And whenever it's above, I'm called, I call it an on state. And whenever it's below, I will call it an off state. And so the on states, I make black. And the off states, I turn white. So I just binarize the data. The theory would still work if I break it down into four different states or three. So it just gives you more, a larger matrix, more states to work with. So what does it look like for having um, 64 states um, uh, of actual neural data? And um, I would look at them in the present, and then I would look at them in the future. Well, it gives us a matrix, a transition probability matrix, where you can see that the, um, the color here shows the probability of the system going from one state into the other. And you can already see that there's some interesting structure, most prominently, that the system has memory. So the system likes to stay in its own state. And the first um, interesting uh, analysis that I would propose here is you can use this for your data, and then you can play with the time. You can see how much do I have to move until the system moves out of its original state. When I do that for my neural data, I find that it is roughly on the order of one synapse. So if I go uh, past that, then the system all of a sudden starts to go into more interesting states. You might also feel that this is not an interesting way to look at the data. So what I would propose is that each time we have a matrix like that, we can apply graph theory. So we can take each of these states as a node in graph theory space. And then the causal interactions, um, the, the probability that the state moves from one to another, we can take as the thickness of the edges between the graph. So if I do this for the matrix that I just showed you, it becomes very hard to even visualize. So let me make it even more simple. So what I will do now is take three measures of the brain. And I will do this in the upper, middle, and lower layers of cortex. So there's only three states. So all of them are inactive. All of them are active. And then you can see how the system transitions from one state to the next state. One thing that's interesting here, I think from a cognitive neuroscience perspective, is that you see these loops. So again, this is the system having a certain likelihood to end up in its own state again. So in a way, you can think of this as feedback. So you can already see that feedback is more likely for some states than for other states. And you can, again, play around with, uh, for example, the time that you take in between these measurements. And you can investigate. Some of the feedback loops, they might become thinner or go away. And then as you look further into your data, they might reemerge as feedback re-enters the system that you're looking at. Yes, Gordon? Why is that a feedback loop and not just like specific? Or memory. Things? Yes. Yes. I should be more careful how I phrase these things. Yeah. So totally agnostic about it. So the system could just persist. Could just be hysteresis. Yes. I think it would be feedback. It would be easier to argue if you, stay, if you look at that as a function of time, and it disappears and then reappears again. That, that, would, that would maybe show that there's some reverberance going on. But yeah, that's a great point. Um, and so I'm, I'm, taking, I'm, I'm cutting a long story short um, uh, of, of looking, at, looking at these transition probability matrices in these um, uh, actual graph structure, uh, it does show you, when, when I looked at uh, my lab's data, it does show you a lot of interesting structures. So for example, the question before, what if the system has a very strong memory? Well, we do know that a lot of the neural data is 1 over f uh, distributed. So it does have memory over time. And so what I found is that this, um, if, if I compare this actual neural data to a system that I artificially produce, where I have control over these variables, and I can just cor introduce correlations however strong I want them in between the data or causal interactions, or I completely uncorrelate the system, um, then I do find that um, there's a, um, a stereotypical pattern right here. And as I said before, we could use this as a baseline. We could say, well, that is what an uncorrelated system looks like. And any deviation from that would be a more interesting deviation. Yes? That's basically what I, what I just said. Yeah, so you, you, I mean, you can take uh, artificial data and you can uncorrelate it. And so I took it out because um, I want to use the rest of the talk to get at the maybe most interesting part. But um, if you take a system that's completely uncorrelated, you end up with a structure that's called the Hamming distance. And so the Hamming distance is that the transition probability of, of a system that's in 0, 0, 1 to go to 0, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0 to go to 0, 0, 1 should be higher than the transition probability from a system to go from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1 because more has to change. 
So the system is more likely to end up in this state than in that state. And so that, that you can measure, uh, it's, it comes out as the Hemming distance, and so a very well characterized geometrical space. And so you can either use it as a matrix or you can use it as a graph, and then you can take um, any kind of distance that you like between multidimensional uh, sets of data, the Mahalanobis distance, Euclidean norms, any, anything like that, to see how far it differs. Okay, so this is just the first step of integrated information theory, but you can maybe see why I'm already excited about that. As an experimentalist, you, you, we tend to look at new tools that might allow us to look at our data in new ways, and I think this is what it does. And so all of us might have this feeling that Galileo had maybe when for the first time he was able to look through a telescope and he discovered things out in the solar system that haven't been seen before. So I'm not arguing this is Galileo's telescope. I'm just saying that here's another interesting tool to look at your data that um, might be worth your time and more consideration. But there's more to it. So what I said in the beginning is that integrated information theory severs some of these causal connections and see what the system does. And so that rests on uh, 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 something called do algebra that was um, introduced to the field actually decades ago already by Julia Pearl. So that's a tool of statistics. And so again, I'm not gonna do it justice, of course, in the short amount of time that I have, but I'm just gonna give you the general idea. So if you have a very simple statistical system, so say you have one variable and you're interested on its effect on the other variable, and you have a confounding variable that affects both. That's a very common statistical problem because if you just do a correlative approach, this right here uh, causes huge pain. And so we call this a fork in a, in a causal statistical sense. So what Julia Per said is that we can uh, get at the causal effect right here beyond the correlative approach using his do calculus. So what is this magical approach? Well, we know as scientists that in order to find causality, we have to make interventions. You have to intervene into the system, and then you see causal effects. What do calculus allows you to do is to intervene into the system without physically doing so. So you're intervening in it statistically, if you will. So uh, how do you do that? Well, if you, if you think of this uh, system described in a similar way as I just did, where you know the transition probabilities between each of these states of the system. So you have a full statistical description of the system, and you also know the causal graph. So you know the causal connections. What you can do is you can um, computationally keep one of these variables constant or manipulate it and then study the effect on the whole system. So in this case, if you keep this variable at a certain value, you're severing this connection. Now this variable right here, the confounder, can't affect this one anymore because you're keeping it constant. It can't change. So whatever this guy does, it doesn't affect this guy. Does that make sense? It can still affect this guy, but it can't affect this guy anymore. So you're making an intervention, and you're also doing what I just said. You're, you're, mutilizing, you're mutilating the system by getting rid of one of the causal connections. Is this really different and targeted uh, that analysis in graph theory? No, I think it, 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 well, it, it's out of my wheelhouse, but it might be very similar. Yeah. So let me give you a concrete example. So if you have, if you have, the, um, if you have uh, a simple transition probability matrix, so in this case you have only two uh, um, two different parts of the system, and they're either both off, one is on, the other's on, or both are on, and then you look at uh, t plus some point in the future, and you look at the transition probabilities, and you wanna make this intervention. So you wanna uh, um, uh, mutilate the system. So what you can do is you can disconnect um, the system through um, what um, uh, in this case would be called statistical noising or marginalizing. So you, in this case, let's say the first element we wanna get rid of, and so what you can see right here is that in this case, and that case, if we eliminate it or eliminate it, it comes out as basically just averaging these two states together because this is zero, zero, so that's average where the second one is in zero, and you get this transition probability, or in this case, the second element is one and one. So we don't, we don't care about this anymore, so we just average that and we come out at 0.5. So you come out with a new transition probability matrix where you artificially intervene and you took out part of the system. Now, this transition probability matrix is different than this transition probability matrix. So if you look at the, um, if you look, look at the transition probabilities, it looks like you, you severed uh, something that you shouldn't have. There's, there's a causal effect in the system. If you would have done this and it would be exactly the same outcome, then uh, what you just severed, what you artificially intervened, uh, didn't have an effect. And you can basically eliminate it in, in this approach, yes? Can you go back one? Yeah. So you started this by saying, assuming you know, yeah. But, but I mean, you know, this is this is a very simple third variable problem. I mean, we that's what we want to know usually. Yeah. And a simple, you know, just with three variables, 
trying to figure out what mediating was. And that, I mean, we, we, we can't charge this before we should have causation with three. Yes. Uh, what aspect of this is fixing that problem? Yeah, so um, two responses, then, again, you might not find them satisfactory. So the first one is that, that I would say, uh, we just make that assumption again. In this case, that if you're looking at an individual column, uh, we're, just gonna, we're just gonna assume that it's, it's causally close, and we're just gonna make these assumptions. So we know, for example, that the middle layers connect to the upper layers, and the upper layers connect to the lower layers, so we can come up with a very simple graph like that. Um, and we know that there's assumptions and maybe even violations in there, but we can still use it as a model um, and as every model has a shortcoming to look at the data. But I would, I, I, I'd agree with you that's problematic. Um, so what's the other response that I have to that? Well, these electrodes, and there's a very specific response maybe to those of us that are doing neurophysiology. Those electrodes that we have, they now allow you to actually look at connected neurons. So you're getting 100 neurons at a time, and you can look at the, the cross cor uh, correlation of the activity, and you'll find neurons that, that always basically fire together with a little lag of, let's say, four. Uh, uh, milliseconds or so. Yeah. So uh, that means that you can establish very simple systems, in this case, something like this, where you have interconnected neurons and you're not making um, uh, any, any uh, major violations. Um, that, this having said, yes, uh, the, the whole theory, if you, if you take the theory at heart and if your end goal is to find out if the system is conscious, how much is this conscious, what the conscious states are, you would have to do this for maybe all of the neurons that the brain measured at the same time. In fact, there's, uh, the people that, that talk about the theory, they would admit that it could be worse. It could be that it's not the neurons that matter, but the synapses. And we would have to measure all of the synapses at the same time. But it could also be that that isn't what is the, the physical basis of what gives rise to phenomenology. And areas is the way to go, or columns. We don't know what the right level is. And so what they are arguing is, um, I think what is a part of the research program, is to compute these different values on these different spatial and temporal scales and see where it peaks. So, but yes, um, there are. As with any technique, there's, there's, a, there's a chasm here between um, the, the theoretical foundations and then how we can use it. And so my uh, appeal is uh, uh, take it with a grain of salt, but just give it a try. Violate the assumption, see what happens. So and here's maybe the good transition why, why uh, I think that might be interesting. So this right here is actual data from my lab. And so in blue and in red, you see these are um, uh, basically neuronal activation. Um, while the animal, in this case, is just fixating at the screen, nothing is happening, then a stimulus comes on, and then in blue, the animal pays attention, and in red, the animal does not pay attention. And so we're measuring activity across uh, the layers, in this case of area before. And so there's two things that, that I, um, I want to point out. So this right here are these representations in graph theory that I just told you about. These down here are just 2D Pearson correlation coefficients between the matrices that are underlying, in this case, the red versus the blue state. And so if, you, if the animal is just fixating and uh, nothing is going on, you, and I'm computing the phi value, which would be about the level of consciousness in this case, you can see it's pretty low. And then when the stimulus comes on and I'm computing the phi value, making all of these assumptions, you can see it's going up. So despite all of these assumptions being uh, violated, the theory still seems to hold. The really interesting part is right here. If I compute phi versus the state where the animal pays attention, it's the highest, versus if the animal doesn't pay attention, it sinks um, even below the, the baseline value, as you might expect if the animal is uh, now sucking up all of the attention to one part of the field uh, rather than, than widely distributing it. So this is just um, uh, one example that uh, the, the summer break allowed me to do uh, by uh, uh, getting into my own data and doing Mat MATLAB. They got me excited because I just put the theory to its test. I put, uh, held its feet to the fire, and uh, it did what it was supposed to do. Now, of course, there's many mo more of these examples in the literature. So uh, it seems that most of the tests to the fire have so far held true. But the original idea, as I told you guys, was this that we're not just getting at the level of consciousness, but at the contents of consciousness. So in order to do that, we have to take another step. And so this step is a transition from integrated information theory as you know it, as I've just introduced it, which uh, got published as integrated information theory 3.0. It's actually the third revision of the theory. Now, integrated information theory 4.0 is about to come out next year, I've been told. But all of the math, but most of the math has already been developed, and computer code is available uh, for free on the internet. 
so that you can already run your data through integrated information theory four. What is interesting about integrated information theory four? Well, it comes up with a new way to come at that cause effect structure. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I snuck it in another time. So what it does, it basically takes what I just said <clears throat> in terms of looking at these causal interactions, but rather than just looking at the states of the system, it becomes even more multidimensional. It now takes, um, you see, combinations of different states, um, and if the more measurements you have, um, the more come out of it, and basically uh, applies the same kind of logic not just to the individual uh, states, but the combinations of states in between. And so uh, IIT40 calls these uh, relations, and as I said, the, the, uh, the math and the code has just been available for that. So just give you a brief insight, again, just very little uh, time that I had available to look into that. For this example that I've been showing a couple of times now of neural data recorded in the middle upper lower layers, and I'm running this IIT40 code to look at out of all these possible combinations, which one of those are irreducible? Which one have actual, actual causal power? So one thing that's a little confusing is that we now uh, move to different terminology. So A, B, and C would be, in this case, uh, the different layers of cortex. And you can see that only one of these layers turns out to have causal power by itself. The other layers of cortex, they only act synergistically. But more surprisingly to me, most of the possible uh, interactions that are, that, uh, that uh, you can theoretically come up with in this multidimensional space turn out to be reducible. They actually turn out to be non-causal. And I think that is very exciting for most of us that are interested in how do I deal with these massive amounts of data that I'm getting from fMRI, EEG, neurophysiology, that we can reduce the dimensionality of these data in a meaningful way. So rather than what a lot of techniques do these days, take an external perspective and saying, I'm decoding the system, I'm looking into the system, what allows me to predict behavior, what allows me to post-dict the stimulus conditions? This is taking an intrinsic perspective and it's saying, which one of the interactions in my data are important to the system? They actually matter. So uh, I would argue this uh, might be a way for us to get closer to understanding um, the system as it functions itself. So, if you uh, agree with me, uh, or uh, you have only slight disagreements, you can now see why this qualia structure approach is something that has gathered a lot of YouTube channels, a lot of, um, a lot of fanfare, a lot of uh, special issues and conferences. If not, you might feel, one more time. <laughs> if not, you might feel like Albert Einstein, that uh, maybe uh, we're going a little bit too far with the math, um, and uh, we should maybe stick a little bit closer to the data. In either case, uh, I say it en français, merci.